it. We will have a deep dive into memory. Good afternoon, dear audience. I hope you have enjoyed our tea break. Today, I would like to talk about the detailed technology regarding memory access. We will be focusing on performance specifically. Out of time limitation, we won't be introducing the theory a lot, but I want to share with you an actual user case. We will explain to you what is the performance of memory copy behind the application, how the movie is going to be. In this way, we will be able to have a better understanding for optimization. After this session, I hope each one of you can really feel the differences, and uh, we will be able to know how to have it optimized. This is the example I would like to introduce today. PVP is a very typical NFV scenario. So the packets is uh, transformed to the virtual machine and uh, send it back and then send through the net card. It is a very simple cycle. How to realize and implement this? We can look at the framework. It is also a very simple architecture. On the host, we are seeing the forward application. On the top, we can see the virtual machine forward operation. In the physical NAND card, we can have it transformed to cache directly. In this way, we will be able to improve the performance with the virtual machines and uh, the host, we can go to vhost to do the transaction. In the morning, we have already a specific session talking about vhost and uh, OTIO. The basic principle is uh, based on shared memory. Two memory copy will be sent with the host. The data will be copied from host to virtual machines. Memory and when the data is uploaded, the virtual I.O. will know the information arrived, and it will receive the information. The forwarded packets will also be managed through ring ops. The memory copy we will also send through vhost. So both TX and uh, RX are managed by vhost. Nonetheless, the message will be sent from the net card. The process seems very simple, but what's happening actually behind is uh, not as simple as it seems. Now let's take a closer look. We can give a quick introduction on the overview of memory system. This is the traditional dual CPU server. There are two memories and two CPUs. Each CPU correlates to one memory. On every CPU, there are several cores. There is also one shared cache. If one of the CPUs needs to receive data, so how does it operate? First of all, as we all know about the message protocol, there are all sorts of protocols. Protocol, essentially speaking, it is a state machine. For example, Corbin needs to load some data. One scenario is the data is in the memory. Then the memory will load it directly. If it is in the last row cache, then it will be loaded from last row cache. If it is modified already, between the two cards, it will go back to LLC. The delay will be higher than LLC loading directly. It seems like between two cards, but uh, it actually goes through this process. 
The last scenario is similar to the third condition, but it had even higher latency because it need to go through the bus. The latency will be really high. To be more detailed, in one call, it can be more complicated on the right-hand side framework. We still have two additional layers of cache. We also have AGU. We also have PLB. We also have DTLB, etc. If the CPU need to do the loading, how does it happen? First of all, it will assign a load buffer. Second, through the scheduler, it will execute the load. The first step of the execution, of course, will be AGU. When the address is set, since it's still virtual, to actually load it, you will need to go through DTLB to transform the address. After the fourth step, we will can actually load the data. When the data is loaded, we will need to have a searching process. Of course, the searching will go L1 cache first. If no L1 cache, then to search in L2, then the last cache. It still depends on where the other calls have modified the data already. I have prepared a table for your reference. In Intel Hasbell cache parameters, this is a great reference when we do the programming. For cache science, it is a four bytes. For all the cache, it is using the unit of uh, 64 bytes. No matter what types it is, in the application, it will always be 64 bytes. Second, let's take a look at latency. This is the fastest latency. In the reality, according to different scenarios, the latency might be higher. If you are closer to the execute unit, of course the latency will be shorter, but the size will also be smaller. L1 is 4 cycles, L2 is 11 cycles, LLC will be 34 cycles. Since LLC has different frequency than the call, so the fastest is 24 cycles. The last condition is if it is L2 and L1D in other calls, then the latency will be even higher. For peak bandwidth, on L1D, one cycle can go through two loads plus one stop. These data are affected from as the practical workload. This is a 2 to 1 percentage. If we would like to maximize the bandwidth, we will need to use AVX. Despite the maximum bandwidth can be loaded under 64 bytes because it can support one, two loads and one stop. If we use AVX instruction, we can have 256 bytes, which is 32 bytes. If you load the tool, plus together it will be 8 bytes. The rest of bytes will be wasted. In order to maximize the bandwidth, we recommend to use AVX. Next, let's take a look at an example. How exactly did we do it? Memory copy is the focus of the case study because memory copy is actually where the data flows. What is our first impression for this framework? On the call, it runs the forwarded message and the copying from the card. We would like to have the data from Nick. And uh, you can have the data on the last location directly. 
The second step is to copy the data to guest, which is provided by the virtual machines. So we can make a guess. The data will be copied from LLC to guest. Then the third step is we will forget about the guest. We host we will have the data copied back from we host. Since it is the data transformation between two cards, so the latency will be much higher than the first copy. The last time it will be sent from uh, BDL. This is our current analysis. But it's not exactly accurate. Let's take a long look at the results. This diagram showed the CPU cycles. The blue band represents the first memory copy. We have the data copied from LLC to the CPU cards. For the orange band, it represents the data copy of the second time. As what we have said earlier, the blue band should be lower than the orange because it directly copy the data. And it doesn't happen between two cards. But the white performance looks the opposite. We need to measure the copy cycles. It will disturb how the application is running in the actual application. The data may not exactly the same. But uh, to use this data, it can represent the utility. This is LLC to L1 copy. But for cross-core copies, we have unexpected results. We still need to think out the outcomes and reasons. What exactly is happening? Now let's give a quick overview to what happened. We neglect something. When the data is in the cache, we forget about the locality. It depends on who has operating the data. If we need to copy the data to core 1, but uh, we execute the data to the core 1 location, but uh, it is a core 0 who assigned the task. So, and then afterwards, the data will be put into the cache of core 0 because I mean, as we talked about the details just now, no matter you are executing the program or the, the data must be in the CPU core. So after the first copy, even though in terms of logics, the address is here. However, the data is in the host side cache. And next, for the guest, for their sending and receiving, they didn't touch the data in the process. They didn't access it. They didn't modify it. So under such circumstances, if the host wants to copy the data back, it is still on core zero, still is the host. That is to say, it is only from L1 to L1. It's the internal copy. That, that explains why the performance is so good, and then it is sent out. But well, that's just for discussion. In practice, in real world, this probably, I mean, it's possibly the scenario. If we just forward the messages without doing anything, then it's not necessary. So under such circumstances, let's see how the performance is. First step is the same, and the second step is the same. The data is copied to core, core zero one. 
And the third step is like this. The guest will need to ceremonially access the data, and then the data sh should be shared to the guest core zero, no, guest core one. And then the next step, the fourth step is like this. The host receives the memory copy, the second memory copy, and then suppose it should be from core one to core zero in the last part. But is this the real world scenario? Let's look at the real data. No changes. The same as before. Why is that? I think I was confused. So let's look at what's behind it. The first step is to, to take in data and then copy them. And then the third step is, after we read the data, the data is shared. And then the fourth step, we put one thing, that is, the data can be shared among two different pools. So, if you both if you both have the cache and you didn't modify them, if you modify it, it will be invalidated, but otherwise the cache will remain valid. So, for the last copy, the data is still with the host. Yes, L1 to L1 copy, so the performance has not changed at all. Let's move on. Finally, let's look at this. For virtual machines, after we modify the data, what may happen? The first step, second step are the same. But for the third step, it's similar to what we had before, but Here's the message, here's the data, and then there's a new copy of the data, otherwise there will be a problem with it. Let's look at how the data is. Now the result is obvious. Just now it was only a, around 100 latency, but now the CPU cycle, the number of CPU cycles has increased dramatically. That is to say, we need core 1. We need to write back the cache to... And then the host should go there and use it. That will help maintain the consistency of the cache. And now everything looks normal. However, there's another issue. Why? For this 60 bytes copy memo copy there has not changed. It's the same as before, it has no changes. I do not understand it yet, so that is why we need to look at the source code. I hope you can see the see the source code if you are sitting in the back. You can see them, right? This is the memo copy. The host receives the data from the virtual machine. This is the copy. But if we look at the review, here is one sentence that looks like here's this code. It's prefetch. What it does is that it tells CPU I might use this data later, so please load it to my cache structure. Don't wait until I need it to do it. Otherwise, I will have to be there waiting for quite a while to get it. The hardware, when you access something, when you access the cache, there are different ways to, to prefetch the data. For example, accessing the data in intervals and they can detect true pattern, but why do we still need the software to prefetch it? You can go do your homework. Basically, the idea of the software is to cover the cases that cannot be covered by hardware. Like, the data here is to be accessed only once. Your pattern is not enough to trigger the, uh, the auto-fetch behavior of the hardware. 
So in the code, we have this thing. And then this by this. Now we don't know the data yet. So now we can guess that it's the prefetch that's at work here in this scenario. But is it true? Let's move on to look at further data. After we remove that prefet prefetch thing, here's the 60 byte. Here is the map copy. And the uh, CPU cycle is still very high. So how come it is ineffective on the map copies? Because it's only once. It's 64 bytes. So after we fetch it this time, it may trigger more hardware behaviors. However, it doesn't trigger. I mean, you you will suffer from this lapsy. That is to say, finally, we may, we may need, we, we just need to put that sentence back. I mean, otherwise the promise, the performance will be compromised, especially for small packets. However, we are still curious. Just now, we saw two CPU in our server, and this may happen if we have multiple VM and you put them in the same CPU. I mean, one CPU has limited cores, maybe 18 at most. I mean, the most I have seen is like 18. And multiplied by two altogether, there are 36 cores. But what if you have many VM? So some of the VM will be squeezed into other CPU and how will that affect the performance? I believe there will be some impact. I mean, intuitively, these are like long distance. But how much impact is there? I mean, let's find out in a more rational and measured way. So we put the, tra the transforming a um, software program on another CPU, and then we modify the data, and after that, I mean, at this point, when you do the second memory copy, when you get the data from the VM and take it back from the VM, you will need to go through the distal end, the guest, uh, the guest side, to, to get that copy. So think about it. How the result, what do you think? the result will be. Here's the result. A lot of changes, big changes. I mean, it's like twice as much. The overhead is about twice. That is, the number of cycles increased dramatically, doubled. So if there is data sharing among CPUs, even if you only access the data without modifying it, then be careful because there's the snooping that may lead that may lead to very much the cycle time, the CPU cycles. So don't use the don't use the CPU cores to do two different things. And just now we looked at RT memory copy. Why do we use it? Why don't we write like if we write those codes, we can still solve the problem. Why do we do it? Why do we write the code here? So here are some statistics. That's very intuitive. It shows us. I mean, this is a test case. And in this, I'm copying the Let's see the copy are quite different. So it's for more general case. However, for computer case, it, the data does not have to go through memory and then go to CPU and then get exported and sent out. You don't have to go through such a long path. For DPD case, like the data is hot. It's always hot. We want to achieve the exchange, and this is the case. And about the 
Our team map copy its optimization point is the same as others, that is, we use the AVX load and store. SMD, single instruction multiple data, to maximize the use of the bandwidth. And another approach is alignment handling. These are my simple examples. They are my simple examples to tell you what strengths they have. Here, I again change the code. It supports as long as 32 bytes of mess messages. So in the left hand side is 128. That means like the first generation of AVX. And let's look at how the performance differs. It's about 40 to 50 percent difference. As you can see, the peak bandwidth is about twice different. I mean, if you look at it, in the real world scenario, there may be data latency, like from the last cache or other places, it may be slow. So you don't really see the two or three times difference. In the real world cache, we recommend that when using different architectures, use the longest AVX that supports the architecture to optimize it. And, and one node can, can cache 64 bytes and about a line. I believe it's common sense. Here's one simple example. I don't want to give you an example to say that DBK has the alignment and, and then improves the performance by this many percent. I don't want to say that. What I want to say is that after alignment and memory copy alignment, even without alignment, there is a lot of weakness with the data in the left. The memory copy is the same copy as that one in the right, but the right one used to be aligned, but well, we intentionally made it miss one, one byte. That is, we, move, we let them skip one byte. It sounds like it has done less work than supposed. They skipped one byte, so will the performance be better? No, because the data is not aligned. It is one byte uh, deviated. So the load and store uh, have great overhead. How do we get the overhead? Because when you do not align them, the data may have its issue, and very much such issue may really increase the overhead, even though you don't see it at the software level. But when we execute it with CPU, in my understanding, for such optimization like alignment, it's like shopping coupon. I usually just pay the bill in a restaurant or whatever, whatever, however much they tell me it is, I will just pay. But my wife is different. She's always looking for the opportunities to use the coupon. But that's the difference. She can save a lot. So the same here. We should look for things that are more universal. Uh, so we don't have a lot of theoretical information because there are so many theories already. So we are just uh, copy the menu directly. So I would like to use example for you to have better understanding. In this way, to be theoretical or to be practical, we can understand the actual differences. If you want to understand more information, if necessary, you can read the manuals accordingly. There are a lot of useful information inside. So there are a lot of new information. During the development, we will be able to have really big enhancement of performance. Thank you very much.
Hello, I'm from Cloud Engine. I have one question to ask. You shared us with the preparation and the comparison between the two. The maximum is reaching 1,500. Have you tried even larger ones? We have used VM to VM. Basically, the performance is similar because it is about the bottleneck graphics. And we usually we use Xia to do the packaging. And the usual benchmarking, we don't have a that large size. So I would like to ask a question to the Intel experts. Actually, we found, based on our experiences, when it's above 2K, the move and the sequential bytes is better performed than, are you talking about using strings? Yes. You can have a micro benchmark, and uh, you will see it has even better performance than memory copy. Actually, we can go back and study it in detail. Thank you for your feedback. My question is, talking about Intel DDIO, to my knowledge, Intel DDIO it's a hardware support, right? So I would like to ask, for the DDIO, and uh, what specific scenario will the DDIO be more useful if we use our net card as IROV techniques? Will the DDIO still be functional? For DDIO, I think the answer is yes. Yes, the answer is yes. Actually, for DDR of scenarios, it means you can have real-time processing of the data, and the bandwidth occupation is really high. This has the best enhancement. For the other user cases, we also have the enhancement. Because for such technology, it's not transparent to software. It is in the hardware layer. I don't really know. For this specific scenario, I would probably analyze whether your DDR has enhancement, and I may probably need this, so the DDR is not transparent, so the software is not visible. Yes, you don't need to do too much. You can have it uh, turned off in the CPU, in the bus. You can also have it turned on. I know, actually. For hardware, the answer is no. Any other questions? If no further questions, thank you to Zhi Hong.